Hello, my name is Cesar Salgado, and this is my paper for the Lausanne Long Conference. Boom and Bust, Locating Revolution in the Benson Collections, Julio Cortazar Papers. Upon arriving at Berkeley on fall 1980 to teach a seminar about invention and commitment in Latin American fiction, Julio Cortazar had his friend in Paris the Argentine poet and critic Saul Yurkiewicz sent a private letter to Don Gibbs, the acquisitions librarian at the Lati Lee Benson Library. Dated August 13th, Yurkiewicz there informs Gibbs that Cortázar was seeking a home for the manuscripts of some of his by then world famous novels. Yurkiewicz points out that Cortázar had the habit of saving the corrected type scripts of his intricate novels while quickly discarding the originals of his renowned fantastic stories. Cortázar famously wrote the later in one flash as in a trance and did not look back to make extensive revisions, nor did he care ever to keep a record of his extensive, extensive correspondence. Still, Yurkevich teased that Cortázar's conscientious disposition of his novelistic materials could be of great interest to literary scholars and specialists. Quote, the first set of manuscripts is a box that contains all the preliminary materials, newspaper clippings, scribblings, notes, and early corrected typescripts in a way that would allow piecing together the genesis of the novel." Close quote. Yurkiewicz reminds Gibbs that, quote, no library yet possesses any manuscripts whatsoever by Julio Cortázar, close quote, adding that Harvard was already expressing interest in their purchase. Still, at this point, he was exclusively referring to Cortázar's last published novel ever, Libro de Manuel of 1973, translated as a manual for manual by Gregory Rabasa in 1978, rather than to the much more celebrated Rayuela of 1963, translated as Hopscotch by Rabasa in 1977. Official negotiations ensued and expanded in February 1981 in exchanges between Gibbs, Yurkevich, and Cortázar himself. This new round of letters now involve the acquisition not of one, but of nine boxes of literary manuscripts. For about a year, materials matters stalled since Gibbs could not gather enough money from donors to meet Cortázar's asking price for the complete collection. The parties finally agreed to a staggered purchase that began in June 1982 and concluded in November 1983 with the delivery of eight shipments of materials, each priced and paid separately. This ingenious arrangement allowed Gibbs to allocate and disburse funds across two budget years. By October 1982, the Benson already had in its possession three boxes with the revised drafts of Cortázar's best known novels, Libro de Manuel, 62 Modelo de Armar, and Rayuela. The next two shipments received in November 1982 included recent writings already in the process of being released as books by Mexico's Editorial Nueva Imagen. Two notebooks with lightning drafts of the fantastic tales reunited in Cortázar's two last short story collections, Queremos Tanto a Glenda of 1980 and Des Horas of 1982, and an early draft of Cortázar, Cortázar's also forthcoming and only book of poems, Salvo el Crepúsculo of 1984. This last, the last three boxes received between June and November of 1983, leap backwards in time rather than forward. They included unpublished works that Ayon Cortázar had written in Peronist Argentina before starting his long self-exile in Paris in 1951. 
Biographers agree that by leaving the country, Cortázar had sought to escape what he then considered an authoritarian populist regime that was threatening his expressive rights as an independent writer with a cosmopolitan outlook and a ludic bohemian lifestyle. These works showed how Cortázar at that time was integrating creative procedures and behavioral codes from French surrealism and existentialism that sought transcendence and meaning through art, play, and eros as ways to counter absurd social conventions. The first box included the, book, the book-length aesthetic treatise, Teoria del Tunnel, written in 1948, and three short absurdist plays. The last two brought youthful surrealist novels, Divertimento, written in 1949, and El Examen, written in 1950. The Cortázar estate, for years headed by his first wife, Aurora Bermudez, kept their copyright and would con contract out these early writings for publication in the coming years. These books would quickly become key staples in critical and biographical scholarship on Cortázar. Oddly enough, your Kievish pro promise of including supplementary genetic materials along with revised drafts was fulfilled in only one case. The box with the corrected typescript for Libro de Manuel, a manual for manual, also included a red notebook that Cortázar marked as his log book. 60 of its pages are inscribed with themes, plot schemas, character lists, diagrams of urban settings, quick drafts of dialogue, diary-like entries, typesetting instructions, reminding, reminder notes, and the writer's self-imprecations. Cortázar wrote and then crossed many of these out in black, blue, green, and red ink between July of 1970 and January 1972, as he assembled the novel in a collage-like fashion, reminiscent of Rayuela's kaleidoscopic insertion of fictional, non-fictional, and metafictional disposable chapters into its main narrative. In Rayuela, these disposable chapters ran the gamut from advertisements for flash sippers to theoretical musings by Morelli, one of Cortázar's many metafictional avatars, on how to write a new novel that could unhinge the reader's consciousness by circumventing Western metaphysical and narratological frameworks. Like he did with Rayuela, Cortázar conceived Libro de Manuel, a manual for manual, as an almanac novel, novela almanaque, by interspersing headlines and paragraph from about 70 news clippings while developing the fictional story. Here he visually overlaid them onto the typographical and spatial layout so that the reader could see them as urgent and essential and not as dispensable items. For the most part, this clippings reported on egregious human rights violations in dictatorships across Latin America, as well as in liberal democracies in Europe and North America at the height of the Vietnam War. Cortázar cut and clipped these from his systematic daily reading of Le Monde, La Nación, Prensa Latina, and other international press groups and telex agencies. The clippings are amply mentioned in the logbook from the start. Cortázar carefully situated each on selected pages of the manuscript, but they are all currently missing at the Benson. In a then unpublished essay included elsewhere in the collection, Corrección de Pruebas in Alta Provenza, Cortázar chronicles his experience proofreading the galleys for Libro de Manuel while driving around High Provence in an RV vehicle in September 1972. There he explains that the clippings had been retained by the typographers at the Buenos Aires Lucho Torres Agüero printing office that Editorial Sudamericana had contracted to compose the galleys 
according to Cortázar's instructions. The next box, on the other hand, did not contain any preliminary, preliminary materials at all, only the corrected Thai script for his boldest experimental novel, 62 Modelo de Armar, 62, a model kit, an uber formalist sequel to Rayuela. Box three, the priciest one, brought home the collection's crown jewel, the dog ear, multi-stapled, heavily revised type, typescript chapters of the iconic Rayuela. Still, it lacked as well its now famous logbook and did not feature any additional miscellany. In 1980, Cortázar had decided to pass on the Rayuela logbook as a gift to his friend Ana Maria Berrenechea, the Argentine scholar of fantastic literature. She would dissect, analyze, and publish it in a groundbreaking manuscriptological facsimile edition released by Editorial Sudamericana in 1983. After all copyright payment and shipping issues were settled, Benson director Laura Gutierrez Witt published a note in the November 1983 issue of the General Library's newsletter titled Benson Collection Acquires Julio Cortazar Papers. There she states that the key reason for the purchase was, quote, to broaden the library's potential for literary research, unquote. This was the rationale that Gibbs had put forward when he submitted his appraisal of the collection's monetary and scholarly value as after consulting faculty experts at the Department of Spanish and Portuguese. Already a Mecca for historians and social scientists of Mexico, Central America, and the South Cone, Gibbs argued that the Benson collection needed to urgently develop, quote, literary archives, unquote, in response to the staggering academic success that the so-called Latin American boom novelists were having in university curricula in the US and across the world. In an, Octo in an October 5, 1983 memo to the organizers of the university's public lecture series, professors Dina Scherzer, Julio Fontana, and Julio Ortega proposed that a university-wide exhibit of Cortázar's books and materials running from February 15 to June 30th, 1984, should start with an inaugural address by Cortázar himself to publicize and celebrate the acquisition. Cortázar's unwavering commitment to the Cuban revolution after his conversion to socialism in 1963 precluded him from accepting invitations to talk in the United States for over a decade. Either the State Department would bar his entrance by label, labeling him an enemy collaborator due to his international recognition as an advisory board member and as a regular juror in Cuba's Casa de las Americas literary contest. Or Cortázar himself would decline the invitation to protest the brain drain exodus of top Latin American intellectuals into comfortable US academic positions. By the mid seventies, both the State Department's intransigence and Cortázar's own reluctance about visiting the US had abated. Cortázar decided that addressing young progressive audiences as you at US universities would have positive consequences for re revolutionary outlooks in Cuba and the rest of the third world. He thus accepted conference and teaching gigs at Oklahoma University and UCLA in 1975, and at Barnard and Berkeley in 1980. It was thus not far-fetched to assume that Cortázar would have accepted an invitation to participate in the inauguration of his own collection at UT Austin. It would have given him the opportunity to advocate for the Sandinista Revolution in Nicaragua a cause that Cortázar had been tirelessly supporting since 1979, then under heavy attack and harassment by counter-revolutionary guerrillas funded by the Reagan administration. Unfortunately, Cortázar never made it to Austin. On February 12, 1984, three days before the proposed opening, 
Cortázar passed away in Paris after a four year bout with leukemia. His suspicion of this condition was what motivated him to consult Yurtuevich about securing an institutional home that could assume professional custody of his manuscripts and compensate him appropriately for their prestige and scholarly potential. Cortázar's untimely death in 1984 did not forestall what would be a seismic transformation of the Latin American archival landscape detonated by these transactions. The Benson Collection's acquisition of the foremost manuscripts of the so-called boom, the DNA of the viral textuality that would set off that pandemic, ignited what would become a compulsive, perhaps convulsive, pursuit of Latin American literary manuscripts across North American universities. I believe schools such as Princeton, spearheaded by his Latin American bibliographer, Peter T. Johnson, and Yale, headed by Latin American library curator, Cesar Rodriguez, would quickly take and run away with a lead. With this premium on writers' archives and manuscripts, the 1980s marked what critics have called the genetic turn across literary analysis and humanity scholarships on and in Latin America. The question of how tendentious or careless editorial protocols could distort, repress, but also consecrate divergent writing practice by outlier authors required reconceptualizing published editions as just one step in an open-ended process of scriptural negotiations, rather than as a final conclusive product for aesthetic or critical consumption. This, this turn was impelled by the construction's fixation on what Jacques Derrida called the violence of the letter, in which writing was regarded as a primordial cultural act that paradoxically superseded oral and popular expression. The construction's focus on the politics of trace and erasure in literary and philosophical discourse led to an interest in documenting scenes of rewriting and reversing cases of textual corruption. This movement was especially felt in the flagship of textualist scholarship, James Joyce studies, second only to Shakespeare studies up, to till, up until this day, with Han Walters Gobbler's 1984 corrected edition of Ulysses, with its computer assisted reassemblage of the novel's continuous manuscript text as its main editorial innovation, taking the academy by storm. The alterations that Joyce holographs confronted before, during, and after publication led specialists to scrutinize the multiple drafts, manuscripts, and collected proofs of a portrait, Ulysses and Finnegan's Wake, kept in collections at Cornell, UT Austin, the Rosenbach Library in Philadelphia, and the University of Buffalo. Librarians and scholars in Latin American studies started to follow suit by collecting and scrutinizing the Joyce Lice manuscripts, such as Cortazar's, that were understood to be at the epicenter of the boom. Thank you.